the first time Soviet advisors heard reports of the F-14 Tomcat shooting down multiple aircraft at extreme range, most dismissed it as exaggerated propaganda. Their entire doctrinal framework, rooted in close-range dogfighting, ground-controlled interception, and massed formations, simply did not allow for a fighter that could detect, track, and kill opponents far beyond visual range with near impunity. Throughout the 1970s, internal briefings circulated through Soviet air defense PVO units describing the American embargo on Iran, the limited number of Phoenix missiles produced, and the supposed unreliability of the AIM-54 system. In their view, the F-14 was an overbuilt carrier toy, expensive to maintain, too large to maneuver, and impossible to sustain in real wartime operations. Laughter often accompanied these assessments, because if the aircraft truly required such intricate electronics and expensive radar components, then, in Soviet eyes, it would collapse under the pressures of a full-scale conflict long before it ever became a strategic threat. But a different reality was unfolding, one that would soon dismantle this confidence. The Iran-Iraq War offered the first and only real-world battlefield where the F-14 Tomcat and its Phoenix missiles were used in continuous, day-to-day -day combat. Soviet advisors attached to Iraq expected the Tomcat to fail quickly under harsh operational conditions and sanctions. Instead, they witnessed something unprecedented. A single fighter capable of shaping an entire air campaign. Early radar tapes and debrief reports sent from Baghdad to Moscow described Iraqi pilots vanishing from radar scopes and flight formations breaking apart long before visual contact. For analysts trained to believe that long-range engagements were essentially theoretical outside of carefully controlled tests, these results were deeply unsettling. The Iranian F-14s demonstrated a capability that contradicted decades of Soviet tactical assumptions. Their AWG-9 radar, designed to track two dozen targets simultaneously, proved resilient even in degraded conditions. More importantly, the AIM-54 Phoenix displayed something the Soviet Union had never accounted for, reliable, repeatable, long-range kills at distances far beyond any Soviet air-to-air -air missile of the time. The Iraqis' own MiG-23s and Mirage F-1S lacked the electronic warfare tools, situational awareness, and radar sophistication needed to counter such engagements. As more aircraft disappeared at ranges approaching 100 miles, Soviet officers began to realize that their earlier laughter had been rooted in misunderstanding, not insight. What truly unsettled them, however, was that this was only the beginning. What unsettled Soviet analysts even more was the pattern that emerged as the war progressed. Each time Iraqi formations approached Iranian airspace, they encountered a level of situational awareness that seemed impossible for a country operating under international sanctions. Radar logs showed Iraqi flight leads abruptly ordering aborts, sometimes before their own instruments detected anything unusual. In post-mission interrogations, many described a sudden spike on their radar warning receivers, an unfamiliar long-range tracking signal that suggested something vast, powerful, and distant had locked onto them long before they could retaliate. That signal, though they didn't know it at the time, was the AWG-9 radar of the F-14 Tomcat sweeping over them from dozens of miles away. From Moscow's perspective, these reports clashed with their long-standing belief that American aerospace superiority was tied almost exclusively to wealth and technological excess. Soviet doctrine emphasized rugged simplicity. Combat aircraft were designed to be repaired in field conditions by conscripts, relying on ground controllers to direct pilots into short, violent engagements. The idea of a fighter jet serving as an autonomous detection and strike platform contradicted everything they had built their air combat philosophy upon. Yet Iraqi losses, particularly among their most advanced jets, forced Soviet advisors to reconsider their assumptions. MiG-23 MS units were among the first to suffer. Their limited radar and poor look-down slash shoot-down capability left them effectively blind when operating below Iranian F-14 patrol altitude. Still, it was the incidents involving the Mirage F-1 EQ, one of Iraq's most valued and modern aircraft, that truly captured Soviet attention. French-built and considered technologically advanced by Middle Eastern standards, it was believed to stand a reasonable chance against the Tomcat. But when multiple Mirage crews vanished without a radio call, visual contact, or any sign of aerial engagement, Soviet personnel realized they were witnessing something fundamentally different from the air battles they had prepared Iraq to fight. Radar tapes revealed no turning fights, no missile exchanges, no evasive maneuvering, 
only aircraft symbols blinking out at extreme ranges before Iraqi formations even understood they were under attack. These catastrophic losses began forcing Soviet planners to confront a dangerous conclusion. Their understanding of long-range air combat was outdated. The F-14 was not just another Western fighter, it represented a shift toward integrated sensor dominance, a type of warfare the Soviet Union had not fully anticipated. And as the reports grew more detailed, one fact became undeniable. The Tomcat's true strength was not in its size or theatrics, but in the invisible envelope of detection and destruction it carried with it. As the Iran-Iraq war intensified, a clearer picture emerged inside Soviet intelligence circles. The Tomcat was not operating as an isolated fighter, but as a miniature airborne command center, capable of shaping the battle space far beyond the reach of any Soviet design platform of its era. The AWG-9 radar, capable of detecting bomber-sized targets at over 200 miles and fighters at well beyond 100, allowed Iranian F-14s to function as early warning nodes, relaying enemy movements to ground controllers even when they were not engaging directly. This was a profound departure from Soviet practice, where fighters were dependent on ground-controlled interception radars and rarely operated with independent situational awareness. The Tomcat, by contrast, fused its own sensors with tactical decision-making in the cockpit, turning every pilot-radar intercept officer pairing into a mobile surveillance unit. The effect on Iraqi operations was measurable. Pilots began reporting that the Iranians somehow anticipated their ingress routes with uncanny precision, often vectoring interceptors before Iraqi jets crossed the border. Some Soviet advisors initially attributed this to intelligence leaks, but analysis of flight patterns indicated a far more technologically driven explanation. The F-14s were detecting Iraqi formations long before those formations could detect anything in return. Once Iranian controllers received the data, they positioned their fighters so efficiently that Iraqi pilots believed Iran had access to real-time data from external sources. They did, but the source was airborne, not foreign. What truly challenged Soviet assumptions was the consistency of long-range kills. Early in the war, isolated incidents could be rationalized as lucky shots or exaggerated claims. But as Iranian records and Iraqi losses accumulated, a pattern of reliable long-distance engagements emerged. In several confrontations, F-14s launched Phoenix missiles at ranges approaching the missile's design limits. The AIM-54, traveling at speeds exceeding Mach 4, did not require a dogfight, a visual merge, or even reciprocal radar detection to be lethal. It simply turned the engagement into a long-range equation of geometry, timing, and physics, an equation overwhelmingly favoring the Tomcat. The Soviet Air Force had invested heavily in close-range maneuverability and GCI-supported tactics, but the Iranian F-14s demonstrated a new paradigm. The side that sees first and shoots first almost always wins. This principle, later termed beyond visual range dominance, became impossible for Soviet planners to ignore. Every Iraqi loss at extended distance reinforced what analysts in Moscow were beginning to admit privately. Their doctrine had not prepared them for a future where the first visual sighting might occur only after the aircraft had already been destroyed. The implications of this realization were only beginning to unfold. As intelligence files deepened, Soviet aerospace engineers began re-examining their assumptions about American missile technology. For years they had believed that long-range air-to-air missiles were inherently unreliable in real combat, too easy to spoof, too dependent on perfect radar conditions, and too vulnerable to jamming. Yet the AIM-54 Phoenix repeatedly demonstrated the opposite. Even when operating in the harsh electromagnetic environment of the Iran-Iraq front, an airspace cluttered with ground radar emissions, surface-to-air missile tracking, and overlapping civilian traffic, the Phoenix routinely found and destroyed its targets. Analysts reviewing Iraqi black box fragments found no evidence that the aircraft had ever detected the incoming missiles. This was because the Phoenix was not a conventional interceptor weapon. It combined high-altitude loft trajectories, semi-active guidance, and an independent terminal seeker into a single unified system. Once launched, the missile climbed rapidly, using thin air at altitude to conserve energy while maintaining Mach 4 speed. From that vantage point, it dove toward the target with enormous kinetic force, making last-second evasive maneuvers nearly impossible. The concept itself was revolutionary. Instead of meeting an enemy in a turning fight, the Tomcat simply removed the enemy from beyond their own engagement envelope. 
Soviet strategists had predicted that such an approach would fail in the chaos of war, yet Iran's operational results indicated the Americans had solved the technical challenges decades earlier. At Soviet flight academies and test centers, the implications were debated with growing urgency. If a fighter could kill from 50, 80, even 100 miles, then traditional dogfight-centric tactics, aggressive merges, vertical maneuvering, and gun-based training were becoming strategically obsolete. The Tomcat's performance in Iran also raised an uncomfortable question. How would Soviet frontline aircraft fare if they encountered F-14s supported by the full might of the U.S. Navy? Iranian Tomcats operated with limited spare parts, inconsistent maintenance, and no carrier-based logistical support, yet still achieved startling effectiveness. What would the same platform accomplish when maintained by American crews, operating from supercarriers, backed by E-2 Hawkeye early warning aircraft? This comparison forced Soviet planners to confront an even broader concern. The F-14 was not merely a fighter. It was a demonstration of American doctrine, where high-fidelity sensors, long-range weapons, and information superiority shaped the battle space before opponents could react. The Iran-Iraq War proved the concept worked, and that meant the Soviet Union was entering a future where reaction time alone might determine survival. By the mid-1980s, what had begun as scattered battlefield reports evolved into a strategic alarm inside Soviet air defense circles. Intelligence officers compiled case studies demonstrating that Iraqi pilots, many trained under Soviet doctrine, were often defeated before they understood they were being targeted. This was more than a technological gap. It was a doctrinal crisis. Soviet training emphasized discipline, tight formation flying, and reliance on ground controllers. But the Tomcat-Phoenix combination dismantled this structure entirely. Iraqi formations that depended on GCI direction were being cut apart from ranges so distant that ground controllers could not issue corrective commands in time. The chain of command simply could not react fast enough to the Tomcat's detection and firing cycle. Furthermore, attempts to adjust tactics, such as low-altitude ingress, dispersed formations, or rapid pop-up attacks, proved insufficient. The AWG-9 radar excelled at detecting low-flying targets, particularly when viewed from the elevated perch of an F-14 patrol line. Iraqi pilots who descended to evade detection frequently found themselves flying directly into SAM envelopes or losing situational awareness altogether. Meanwhile, climb and dash attempts by MiG-23s and Mirage F-1S only made them more visible to the Tomcat's radar. Even the introduction of faster aircraft like the MiG-25 yielded little change. The Foxbat had the speed, but not the avionics or agility, to challenge a fighter that saw it first, locked on second, and fired long before a merge could occur. What troubled Soviet analysts most was the psychological dimension taking shape inside Iraqi fighter units. Pilots began reporting the AWG-9 radar tone as a symbol of impending destruction. This was not an exaggeration. Statistical analysis showed that once an Iraqi pilot detected the Tomcat's radar sweep, the engagement was effectively lost. They either turned away immediately or continued forward knowing the odds were overwhelmingly against them. Morale deteriorated sharply. Some pilots requested transfer to ground units. Others feigned technical malfunctions to avoid missions near Tomcat patrol sectors. For a doctrine built on discipline and collective strength, this psychological breakdown undermined the entire operational framework. These developments forced Soviet planners to acknowledge a harsh reality. The Tomcat had achieved something they had not anticipated, deterrence through capability alone. When a fighter can eliminate adversaries before visual range, before radio coordination, and sometimes before the enemy even understands the geometry of the engagement, its impact extends beyond the battlefield. It reshapes strategic calculations, erodes confidence, and imposes a constant, invisible pressure on every opposing pilot. The Iran-Iraq War revealed this shift with unmistakable clarity. Yet the true magnitude of the Tomcat's power would become fully apparent only when viewed through the lens of U.S. Navy operations, where the aircraft finally operated at its intended potential. When U.S. Navy operations are added to the picture, the scale of the Tomcat's true capability becomes undeniable. Unlike Iran, forced to improvise amidst sanctions, limited spare parts, and inconsistent logistics, the U.S. Navy operated F-14s within the environment they were originally engineered for, 
carrier strike groups, integrated surveillance networks, satellite queuing, and E-2 Hawkeye early warning coverage that extended hundreds of miles beyond the horizon. In this configuration, the Tomcat was not a fighter performing exceptional feats. It was the centerpiece of a layered aerial ecosystem designed for absolute control of the battle space. Soviet naval intelligence took particular interest in intercept footage captured during high-tension Cold War encounters over the North Atlantic and Pacific. These intercepts showcased the AWG-9's extraordinary reach. The radar could track multiple 295 bombers simultaneously at distances the Soviets previously believed impossible. Even more concerning was the ability of a single F-14 to shadow and manage an entire patrol of long-range reconnaissance aircraft without assistance. Every maneuver of Soviet maritime aviation was recorded, analyzed, and relayed in real time. For a superpower accustomed to operating near American carrier groups with relative impunity, this represented a strategic shift. The U.S. Navy could now build an invisible wall in the sky, long before hostilities ever occurred. Equally troubling for Soviet planners was the realization that the Tomcat's long-range kill chain, sensor detection, target tracking, missile guidance, and strike execution was supported by unmatched naval logistics. Carrier battle groups could sustain F-14 operations indefinitely, ensuring that any attempt to approach them was met with layered detection and response. The Phoenix missile, already deadly in Iranian hands, became even more formidable when paired with high fleet readiness, coordinated radar networks, and continual modernization. By the late 1980s, Soviet assessments no longer dismissed the F-14 as an over-designed American showpiece. Instead, internal doctrine papers acknowledged it as a symbol of a broader American philosophy, warfare defined not by the merge, but by information dominance and engagement at distances where opponents had no practical reply. The Iran-Iraq War had revealed the system's potential. U.S. Navy operations demonstrated its maturity. In the end, the laughter that once accompanied early Soviet evaluations of the Tomcat faded into something more sober, recognition that a new era of air combat had arrived, one in which the pilots who saw first, decided first, and fired first would shape every future battlefield.